so those are some Halston illustrations. And um, I did a Zoom interview a month or so ago with the Rienzi Museum in, in Houston because they're doing a hats off exhibit yeah. of Halston hats, actually. The lady who owned the mansion and turned it into a museum, Mrs. McMasterson was um, a devotee of Halston and collected mm -hmm. a lot of his hats. So when she died, she said, I want to have a strictly Halston hat exhibit. So that's what they've done. That's it's coming amazing. down in January. But anyway, when I did the Zoom interview, I, um, I shot a picture of that. I wanted to do it standing in front of it, but I couldn't do it technically. So this is the next best thing. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, and I think some of them I might recognize because um, I remember I went to a Halston exhibit in September 2015 uh, down in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, oh, cool. Because I, I, I had just read a few biographies on him and I was... I really loved his story. It's it's very Gatsby in a way. It's you know this uh, boy from a small town in the middle of America, and how he sweeps the fashion world, and then he disappears. You know, I, I mean, from my perspective, it's like you know where did he go? Um, but yeah, just his story really enthralled me. Um, and and one of the questions I want to ask is about Chicago because the part about where he. Uh, went to University of Chicago for art or the Art Institute School. Um, he was doing hats in a, one of the hotels in Chicago. And I wanted to know if he had any stories he shared with you. Well, um, he, so essentially Halston was always a forward thinker and he was always looking for the next project or so he didn't, you know, look backwards in time very much. I remember once saying to him because he had a very minimalistic house in, in a beautiful townhouse in um new york and i at one point i said don't you want some furniture in here like some nice antique chest of drawers or something and he's no 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 it all has to be now and modern and futuristic so no i don't do antiques but anyway to answer your question he just spoke about the people who helped him all along the way and there were a few people in chicago um, namely Kukla Fran and Kukla Fran and a Fran Allison of Kukla Fran and Alley um, radio show. She was his first sort of celebrity client. So he always used to mention her and um, a woman who was a writer for the Chicago Daily News, whose name was um, Peg Zwecker. Mm -hmm. She sort of wrote the first article on him that, you know, sort of, put him out there into the world as this great young talent. But and indeed he was, he talked a little bit about, um, and I know just of the history, you know, family history that um, he got his start really. He was partnering with a man named Andre Basil who had a hair salon in the Ambassador Hotel. Yeah. And I was researching for my book that I wrote on him. Which, which I read. <laughs> it was beautiful. Also inventing uh, American fashion, but um I went, I sort of went down memory lane. I went back to Chicago, went to the places that he lived to sort of, you know, feel sort of the, the vibe of where he was living and how he might have been inspired. But Andre Basil was a friend of his who let him come into his salon and Halston would sort of size up the society ladies and figure out the proportions of their face and what sort of little headdress he would create for them. And he always asked this question and he continued to ask this question until the end with a new prospect or a new client, he would always say, well, what's your favorite color? Or what are, what are your favorite colors? So he would get the favorite colors, he would you know, understand their proportions and their, their hair coloring. He dashed back to his little apartment that was close, not too far away on the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what apartment he lived in. I wish I had known that. Yeah. But um, he would craft these little headdresses with very simple, you know, velvet bows or silk moire, um, you know, ribbons and drape this tool or netting because Chicago is the Windy City. So they've just had their hair done. He didn't want to create a hat that would mash down their hairdo. It had to be something that complemented the hairdo, but kept the hair in place as they left the hotel or the salon. So, and he was always inspired by Mother Nature 
from his childhood, he loved Mother Nature and flowers and anything. So that's where he derived his inspiration from. So typically there were bows and sometimes he would incorporate special little flowers that would drape down with a perfect sort of bias drape to them. Mm-hmm. So he, he, you know, he was in Chicago. He, he was there for about five or six years before he was whisked away through a referral to uh, Lily Dache um, to New York, which was really the city of his dream. So, but it, you know, he fled Evansville, Indiana. So he was born in Des Moines, Iowa, but when he was 10, he moved to um, Evansville. Mm-hmm. And um, Evansville was just not a big enough city for him. So he was very delighted to go to Chicago and he went to the art institute there and took some illustration classes and his job, you know, to sort of pay his bills was dressing um, the windows at the department store, Carson, Peary and Scott. Wow. So, but um, the, apparently the teachers at his school said that he just had this innate talent and there was not much that they could teach him. So yeah he just kept doing hats. I mean, he was doing hats earlier in his life for his mother and a neighbor and his sister, not so much hats for her because she was younger, quite a bit younger, but um, so he'd already been doing on his own sort of crafting these hats with whatever was in the house. Sometimes they were little like um, chore boys, you know, those little scruffy pads. He, crafted this fun little hat that had these little scruffy pads hanging down from it and for his mom to wear to church. And um, it was a sensation apparently. <laughs> and pretty much everything he did in the early days was sensational. Well, I mean, throughout his whole career was sensational. And his most famous hat, I'm so surprised it's not, I, I think it's getting better known, but the famous one was the pillbox hat for Jackie O. Um, and I, I think it was for the inauguration day uh, for JFK. I think that's the one he designed, right? Exactly. So she actually came to him to design the hat. She had her outfit designed by a different designer, but she came specifically to Halston to design her hat. And it was just a very simple pillbox, round sort of globe. And... Um, simplicity is elegance that was always sort of his motto throughout his career too so but because she was such a style maven and beautiful and society lady and marrying or she'd married but jack kennedy but this was the inauguration he was so proud to have been able to take on that assignment Mm -hmm. and the funny little story was that it was supposed to be a pure sort of half globe and it was a little bit windy and it was attached with little combs, but it shifted a little bit. So she stuck her hand back really quickly to keep it in place mm-hmm. and apparently didn't know that she'd put a dent in the back of it. And then thereafter, all the ladies that had similar pillbox hats put dents in them because they thought that was the proper style. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> That's a good story. So actually he was very generous. I mean, this is a reoccurring theme, but um, he, this was 1961. He was, had started designing hats at Bergdorf in about 1958. And he was always giving my mother and family members, his sister and his mother hats. So my mom has that same hat just in a slightly different shade. And it's been displayed a number of times too in in museums. That's amazing. Uh, And speaking of the Bergdorf days, uh, there was a quote in one of the books that I read about him. And the quote was, he was the only one that Greta Garbo would talk to. (laughs) I I thought that's so telling about him because she was, you know, very mysterious and aloof. And I thought the only person in that store to, to be him, I was just like, that speaks to he could charm anybody. It sounds like he's really charming and very, very, uh, he somehow strikes a chord with somebody, whoever he comes in contact with. That's absolutely right. He was very charming and had lots of pizzazz. He had an excellent sense of humor. So he always, if people were a little bit nervous, he could cut right through it and make them laugh and set them at ease. So he, he, and he became friends with so many of these people too, so many of his clients including Jackie and her sister, 
Lee and uh, the swans of New York. And it, it was just a natural, he stepped right into it. And he was just a natural in, in all aspects. <laughs> he was an original for sure. Has anything interesting happened since the 2019 documentary to, to yourself or in general? Well, the documentary was um, uh, amazing for me to kind of go through that whole process. It was sort of cathartic to work with the filmmaker Frédéric Chang and Roland Ballister, who was just a genius at producing this. Um, and it was so exciting for me to be going to Sundance and Tribeca and, and I was invited to go to the Moscow Beat Film Festival and speak about my uncle there um, before they showed the movie and it was coming from, um, so just to backtrack a little bit, my father was a foreign service officer back in the olden days, in the dark ages, and we lived in Eastern Europe while it was, you know, you know, we were living behind the Iron Curtain. So it was very communist and um, challenging to say the least. And, you know, the politics totally different from what we know here. Um, so, and he worked, my father worked very hard to champion human rights and to bring down that Iron Curtain. And it happened just as he was retiring. So anyway, for me to go to Moscow, which was like the epicenter of evil, you know, in my childhood. But here there are all these amazing Moscovites that were so cultured and I'm, you know, I'm not saying anything, you know, I'm not passing judgment, but wonderful people. The film festival was in Gorky Park. You may have heard about the book written about Gorky Park. It was, things were seemingly so free and happy and, mothers out in the so that was fascinating for me to see this change in a country and you know in Moscow I guess might be a little bastion of happiness and maybe the rest of the country isn't so um uh, affluent or um doing well but anyway that was that was really fun and um and there's been so many other things that have come come my way too as a result of it. I'm in contract with a gentleman who's an actor. His name is Eric Bergen. I can talk about it. He we're um, trying to get a Broadway show going about Halston too. So um, it's you know Broadway takes a long time, many years to um, to get off its feet. So. And with the COVID and Broadway's shut, shuttered until springtime. So, but hopefully soon we'll strike up the dialogue again and get things going. But he's lined up the best of the best in New York. So I'm very excited about that. I'm really hoping that will go through, but you never know. Yeah, it's, but no, if that happens, I, I've always wanted to visit New York. I think that would be my, my impetus to go. I would definitely yeah. see that show. What are some future plans you have for your uncle's legacy uh, besides this venture with Broadway? Well, I continue to do interviews such as this, and thank you so much for asking me to, to be here with you to talk about my uncle. I'm always very excited to share my memories and, and, um, educate people about my wonderful uncle who was such a um, revolutionary in terms of American fashion. He really helped to put it on the center stage, the world forum actually. Mm -hmm. um, but I have, I continue to do exhibits. So I have, a, and I loan um, gowns to different exhibits. So there's um, at the New York Historical Society, they're doing an exhibit on Catherine Graham, who was the CEO mm -hmm. of Washington Post. And Halston was her go-to designer. So um, he used to say, you know, she's in this high powered position, you know, like the first woman, one of the first women to be in such a high powered position surrounded by men at the, you know, the, 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 at the table and he had to dress her appropriately. And so she would rely on him heavily <laughs> to make sure that, that um, he designed the perfect outfit for her for whatever the meanings were. And the funny little side story is that they did a color study once and uh, well, Halston did color studies regardless, but he talked to her about her trepidations about, you know, one of these big meetings she had to go attend or lead actually. And 
So he designed this beautiful pink sort of tailor thing because pink is a very calming color. And he thought if she was presenting herself in pink, it would calm down the gentlemen around the table so they wouldn't be like going for her jugular. But um, so yeah, museums and the Broadway, and I guess ultimately, ultimately I'd like to produce a film about Halston and then I'll probably call it quits. <laughs> Who do you see playing Halston? Um, Because it's hard to, I mean, he was very handsome, but I don't know if there are any actors that would do him justice. Do you have an actor in mind? Well, Armin Hammer, Armin Hammer looks, he would be very good. A younger Leonardo DiCaprio, actually, when he was younger, Mm -hmm. I thought he could have played a younger Halston too. He has the same eyes. His face was a little bit wider than Halston's, but um, but those are two that come to mind. That's a good one, actually. Army Hammer, yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, oh, this is a good question to ask since we're talking about color. What was his favorite color? Do you know? Well, the non-color black. That was <laughs> proverbial. And I see you're wearing black and I'm wearing black in oh. his honor. Uh, I don't know what this is. It's a dark green, actually. But oh, green. okay. It looks looks black, but uh, it, yeah, <laughs> I can kind of see a little green there. It's the lighting. It's bad. Um, and I'm he, in the bathroom actually because of the acoustics. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I've heard it's good for for singers. They go in the bathroom just to hear themselves. Oh, that's so cool! I remember that. So um, he liked. Well, I, I would say black was his favorite non-color, but red, white, those were the typical colors he wore, kind of ivory white, red, or rusty red, and black, um, his preferred colors. But when he designed, he loved to design in bold kind of royal colors, purples and fuchsias and reds and blues and yellows at one, and then pastels too with his ultra suede he designed a collection of all these beautiful pastel colors with buttery yellow and and mauves and lavenders and it was stunning actually i did an exhibit with the i co-curated an exhibit with the warhol museum and it i remember that it traveled from um pittsburgh to um charlotte and des moines Mm -hmm. but we had a number the Halston company was so generous to loan a number of his pieces. I don't have very many ultra suede pieces, but they had the, all of those pastel colors. So it was, it was really fabulous statement there. The ultra suede statement and all pastels. So you, you have your own thing. You have your own story. Uh, you're a photographer. You used to work for National Geographic. What are you doing now? Well, so I have to say that I worked at National Geographic, but I wasn't a photographer for them. I am a photographer. Uh, I took classes at the International Center of Photography and um, ran my own studio in California for 15 years. And I do little assignments here and there, but I'm really not shooting that much now. I just do my own sort of Mm -hmm. fun nature photography Um, I've got some images that are being published in a book called Art in the Making. A good friend called Christopher Benson, who is an artist, a painter in Santa Fe, is um, putting together this really amazing, inspirational book on a lot of different creatives that he knows. And so it's called Art in the Making, and it's just us sharing some of our work and talking about our process. But I'm a little bit older, so I'm kind of, I'm not... You know, I'm winding down just a little bit, but um, I do, I continue to do nature photography and little photo essays. I'm about to self-publish a little book here in New Braunfels, Texas on, um, it's going to be called The Soul of New Braunfels. New Braunfels is a beautiful old um, kind of cowboy town that was founded by the Germans in the mid 1800s. And the architecture and so it has this very kind of Germanic influence and Victorian and so it's going to be a very rich visual little book that, you know, to sell. But I'm actually a realtor right now. Oh, caring for my elderly mother. I moved here to care for my elderly mother and I'm a realtor. So that's kind of my focus now. And I do photography for fun. But if somebody wants to hire me, I'll do a portrait or 
event or something like that. Where Do you have a favorite place here in Chicago that you remember visiting? Um, it can be any time in your life. Well, I'll have to say I... As a young person, I only went to Chicago a few times because um, my mother was from South Bend, Indiana, and her father was a big sailor. So we used to go, he sailed a ra- the SORC race up to Mackinac Island. Yeah. So we would gather in Chicago and then we would drive up and he would sail up with his crew. So I don't really have many memories except for the yacht club there <laughs> as a little kid, but as I said, when I was doing research for the book, I went back to Chicago in, uh, this was like six years ago, and love the architecture, the old world architecture, but the Millennium Park, fabulous with the big bean thing, very visual for for photographs. Um, And I took a little side trip on my own to the, um, I don't know if it's Lakeshore Drive, but, it's kind of a big crescent scoop and the cityscape is behind you or in the background. Mm -hmm. And the weekend or the few days that I was there, it was absolutely frigid cold. So the lake was actually frozen and you know, the waves had lapped up on the little ladder things that go into Mm -hmm. it and frozen. So it was, I took some really cool pictures there. So I really like that area too, because it's a nice vantage point to see the city. The one question that I'm a little nervous to ask you is about J.C. Penney. Um, you don't have to answer if you don't feel comfortable, but I always wondered why did he, I mean, did he not read the contract clearly? Did he have a bad lawyer? But his name, he, the part of his, part of the bad luck that he, that he hit was with J.C. Penney. They, he couldn't take it back. He couldn't take his own name back. Well, so here's the big picture. Um, When he was just starting out and and celebrating, enjoying lots of successes in the early 70s, people were stealing his name and knocking off his clothes. So he got with a lawyer, tried to find out how he could protect his name. He was already very cognizant of branding Mm -hmm. and he was his brand, his name was his brand. So he trademarked his name, Halston. Mm -hmm. And within a few years from there, from then, um, Norton Simon approached him and said, you know, we can, you know, provide you with the financial backing. Um, You just design. And it was a very good marriage they had. So he signed up with them. And it was, again, he got along really well with um, David Mahoney, who was the CEO, <clears throat> and actually David Mahoney's wife, Hilly, was one of his great clients before this happened. Mm-hmm. And she's still alive and she's such a wonderful lady. I love her. Oh, cool. Um, but so fast forward 10 years, um, this opportunity came up through his business manager, Michael Lichtenstein, who had him sign many lucrative licenses. And this was a very lucrative licensing deal where he, it was, you know, a multi-million dollar deal, but also Halston always wanted to dress America. Mm-hmm. That was his impetus for getting into this. And he was a workaholic, so he thought he could do it, but he didn't realize how much work it was going to be, how many different accessories and collections and kids and homeware and all of this stuff was going to be. And he was a, such a perfectionist, he didn't want to turn this over to junior designers. There, there was a, a slew of, of different designers that were ready to help, and they did to a certain extent, but he always used to say, my name is on the door and I have to make sure that everything is perfect that goes out with my name on it. But as all of that was happening, just happening in 1980, June of 1983, the corporation was sold. So it was kind of like an imperfect storm, if you will, where David Mahoney sold out and Playtex came in with their manager who didn't really know anything about fashion. And it just became very acrimonious. And so it wasn't that it was Halston not understanding the license. It was this other sort of back, you know, stage um, things that were going on that, became very difficult for Halston and within really less than a year they asked him to just leave they had the name the brand the brand recognition and 
until he died, he was supposed to have a certain percentage of interest in his name and the designs, but it just, it, it got really bad and then he got sick. So. Yeah. I remember it, I've watched um, the, I think there was a Lincoln center tribute that Liza had for him. Um, and I remember watching that on YouTube and I thought it was, I thought it was perfect. It's he's a real loss. It, it reminds me of like Howard Ashman um, as in a way, you know, how AIDS took so many of the great artists. Right. It was a tragic time. It was very horrible that all these talent were just dropping like flies. So mm -hmm. my last question is what, what is your favorite memory of you and him together? It could be work related. It could be, it could be like a fishing story, but what's your favorite memory with him? Oh, there were so many, but mostly they took place out in Montauk. So mm -hmm. when all of this nonsense was happening with the business, he took refuge out in Montauk, which was a house he rented from Andy Warhol. It was mm -hmm. further for this most point on Long Island. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, it was still sort of a mom pa fishing village. I guess it's become pretty shishi now. But mm -hmm. anyway, he had this nice old fishing house and, um, we just used to sit out on the back patio and watch the waves roll in and talk about life and getting back to work and what we would do. You know, he wanted me to be part of his company, his, his um, resurgence, but we would go for walks. We used to walk. He, he took me on these safaris, he called them and he put on his little safari gear and his, he had a walk, big old walking stick look like Moses and uh, we'd walk up into the secret area to get to the forest. And it was fun discovering. And I think for him too, it was like the first time in his, since he started working that he was able to just let his hair loose and just go have fun. Like he used to as a kid. So I know he really liked to go into the forest and look at all the flora and fauna um, and I, I don't know, it was, it was nice that he felt comfortable enough with me, you know, his niece, a family member, he didn't have to put on his perfectly starched shirt and stuff. He would wear floppy white canvas hats and <laughs> funny shorts and little, well, he always had like Gucci slipper shoes he would wear, but but other than that, he was casual and, and uh, it was just fun. There was once actually he came. So, you know, I was working in the city and I would come out on the weekends and he came to pick me up. He used to come to pick me up at the train station. And this one night coming, driving back to his house. And again, this was in the olden days. There were no like street lights going all the way out to the house. And I guess there was a police car that was following us. I didn't notice. And he sort of was like, uh oh, and he pulled it into this little, there happened to be a little community, and he pulled in and quickly went around the bend and pulled into someone's driveway and turned out the lights. I was like, what's going on? He said, I just don't want any negative publicity. I don't want anyone, I don't want him to stop us. I don't want, so I thought that was kind of a funny little thing. <laughs> we were crouched underneath the dashboard hiding from the cop. That was funny. Halston was like that. He was, he could be really funny. <laughs> I wish I'd met him. Um, I think every, anybody who knows of him, I think would have wanted to meet him. Um, so, uh, well, I'm going to let you get back to your day. Thank you so much for speaking with me and sharing these memories and some information, some questions that I was dying to ask. Well, thank you very much for, for asking me to do this. And I just want everybody to know that Halston was such a generous person, so thoughtful. And he would, do anything to help young talent like he had been helped in his youth too. So he was the best uncle. <laughs> well, he's like the uncle to fashion. <laughs> uh, yeah. The uncle to fashion. I like that. There's uncle like, what is it? There's like the queen of soul and you know, they always come up with these monsters right. in a weird way. He, and he is because, I mean, I know that with the Versailles, that big, that big event at the Versailles walk in uh, 75, I think it was. 73. If you think about it, he was the uncle to American fashion, at least, because, I mean, that 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 was the turning point for American fashion to be Absolutely. taken seriously. So, actually, yeah, Uncle Halston. <laughs> Uncle 
Austin. And he brought at that event, it was because of him that it was such a sensation because he brought his friend Liza Minnelli into it and she brought Kate Thompson into it to do the choreography. So mm -hmm. had they not had those two elements, it wouldn't have been so star spangled, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, Uncle Halston, the uncle to fashion. I like that. <laughs> you can use that for sure. All right, thank you. I will. <laughs> Well, well thank, you. thank you so much for, for asking me to speak about Halston and I always enjoy our Facebook communications and, and um, happy holidays to you. Happy holidays to you too. Be well, Leslie. Be well. Be well. <laughs> thank you. You too. Bye.